from a bird's eye view, the oddly shaped triangle formed by Moscow's Kremlin could be seen as the heart of Russia. A small state within a state, these red walls have been protecting Moscow's Kremlin for more than five centuries. So to give you an idea of its size, we decided to actually go around it before going inside. We're going to start right here at the Spassky Tower, so time your watch. The extent of the Kremlin walls is over two kilometers, and if you want to go around it, you better go real fast, because the winters in Russia are really cold. It's minus 10 today. The first Kremlin was built out of wood, and it burned down a couple of times before being rebuilt in white stone. Three hundred years later, the walls and the towers were faced off with the famous red brick. But if you actually pulled away the red brick, you would see a wall as white as a bridal gown. And some of these walls are almost six meters thick. Right here on the red square was a deep moat filled with water. And together with the ring of 20 towers, it made the Kremlin an inaccessible fortress known around the world. Stop the watch. Now the tower clock wears the witness. It took us 27 minutes to go around the Kremlin walls. But what about what's behind them? Well, join me on a journey to the heart of the Kremlin, to places hidden from the tourists. You're going to meet some real Kremlin insiders, although they may not be the usual newsmakers you see on TV. So now you're going to meet a true Kremlin scholar. This man is practically saturated with Kremlin history. Sergei Divyatov. Good day. And finally, we meet. Good to see you, sir. The Spassky Gate is the major passage into the Kremlin, and traditionally it has always been open for arriving visitors during the day since the time of Ivan the Terrible. Tsars and emperors used it when visiting Moscow. Anyone entering the gates had to take off their hat to honor the savior of Smolensk, whose image can be seen above the gate. Entering the gate on horseback was forbidden. Legend has it that when Napoleon passed through the gate in occupied Moscow in 1812, the wind tore his famous bicorn from his head in front of the savior. In 1945, hero of the Soviet Union, Marshal Georgi Zhukov broke both rules in one moment. He entered Red Square through Spassky Gate to receive the first Victory Day Parade on horseback and wearing his service cap. So when did the icon appear here? The icon has been here since the 16th century, but disappeared during the Soviet era. It was only a year ago that restorers discovered the icon under a layer of plaster while examining the masonry on this tower. Thanks to them, it was saved. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Spassky Gate was open for passage until the late 90s. But motor transport to and from the Kremlin disturbed tourists walking along Red Square and the Kremlin walls. And with the new millennium came the decision to close the gate. Now it opens only on special occasions, during the 9th of May Victory Day Parade, for example, or on Inauguration Day to receive the presidential motorcade. The only other visitor to pass through the gate is a giant Christmas tree put up for the New Year's celebrations. Could you lead me through those gates? No, but we can enter the Kremlin through the private entrance. A secret entrance for a closed circle is just around the corner. It was very easy to get inside the Kremlin together with you. As for me, I've always wanted to get to the Kremlin clock and especially to the bells. As a child, I always stood outside looking at the clock and I thought a magician lived there who managed the clock. And also, when the bells rang, I was simply rooted to the ground. Can I get inside? 
Yes, but you're not dressed warmly enough. There is a strong wind up there, and it is very cold. I think you'll have to put on something warmer. The Spasskaya Tower was the heart of the Kremlin's defensive line. It was anticipated that any offensive would come from the southeast, and that the tower would be the first attacked. As a result, Spasskaya housed rifle and artillery units. In the mid-17th century, Spasskaya Tower was the first to bear the two-headed eagle emblem of Russia. During Soviet times, they were all with rubby five-pointed stars. But the tower's true gem is its chimes. Its clock face has a six meters diameter. The rim, numerals, and clock hands are all gold-plated. A total of 28 kilograms of gold is needed just to coat them. We're inside the Spassky Tower right now, and we're going to meet a true tower wizard. Sergei Nazarov knows all about how to keep time in this tower. Hello, Sofiko. Hello. So good to meet you. So when did the clock appear in the tower? The chimes we see today have been here since 1852. But clocks appeared on the Spaskaya Tower during the time of Tsar Mikhail Romanov. Let me tell you more about them at the top. All right, I'm following you. To reach the clock, one has to climb nine floors of spiral stairs. Here the clock gears turn steadily, waking every 15 minutes to signal the bells to strike every quarter hour, or one big hit on the hour's end. Do you know the purpose of the bells ringing? Previously, when few people had watches, the chimes informed everyone of the time. Previously, the clock was operated manually, but since 1937, three electric motors took over. Everything else has been preserved in its original form. Spaskaya Tower clock is the oldest one in Europe. Can you see the pointer at the end? No. Yep. This pointer regulates the speed of the clock's motion. If the clock lags behind, it increases the speed. If it's fast, the pointer slows it down. So they do lag behind. But you never notice it, because once it starts to hiccup, specialists quickly eliminate the problem, acting like an ambulance. Well, so far we haven't noticed it, but we're close to revealing it. That's right. This is an ancient bell-ringing gear mechanism for setting up melodies at the Spaska Tower. It's almost two and a half meters in diameter. And what does it sing? It sings the national anthem of Russia. Yes, yes. The bells strike the melody of Russia's national anthem every six hours. Cables run from the geared drum below to the very top where the bells chime in the bell tower. Whoa, here are the bells. Yes, Sovico, we're in the bell tower. If you look up, you'll see it still has a wooden ceiling. 48 bells hang here in imperial times, but were lost during the Soviet era. Today, the chimes sing the Russian anthem with 10 bells and a few metal beats. Up here at 10 stories of the ground, it's always very windy. We gotta go now because the main bell is going to start ringing and we are risking of becoming deaf. And also it's very cold, so we're getting out of here. Over. Escaping from the noises of the bells, just a few minutes later, I found myself near the Kremlin's central square, where people are preparing for a special event. So right now we're on a cathedral square where a giant fir tree is being decorated for New Year's celebrations. This tree stands between the palaces of worship and the palaces of the Tsars. And can I just tell you something? It is 100 years old, which basically means that it was born when the last Tsar was still alive. One can say that this huge Russian Christmas tree has won a very demanding seasonal beauty pageant. Kremlin gardeners spent several months searching Moscow regions for the right candidate. At least 30 meters tall, pyramid-shaped and displaying ample foliage. 
Once these criteria were met, the judges ignored the weight and age. Huge taxi is especially ordered for this Christmas tree, and it's carried straight into the Kremlin. It's 34 meters high. It's like 20 times my height. And in no time, this tree is going to be wearing a department store worth of jewelry and decorations. About 2,000 pieces and 1,500 meters of garland. That's like almost enough to surround the Kremlin in Tussel. The tree is decorated from top to bottom. To begin with, a large star of Bethlehem is put on top. It is a quarter the size of the rubby stars atop the Kremlin Towers, but during the holiday season, it is the most important one of all. Though they look oversized, the ornaments are light. Kremlin old-timers believe that if you have a chance to hang at least one piece onto the tree and make a wish, it is bound to come true. So now we're going to talk to Sergei Nikolaevich, who's like the main decorator of this Kremlin New Year tree. Um, I wonder how long he's been doing this for. So, Sergei, for how long have you been decorating Christmas trees? Well, this is the first time that I'm decorating this tree. For the past four years, I've been working with Christmas trees at Cathedral Square. So who decides how to decorate the Christmas tree? A design project is drawn up to clearly define how to hang all these decorations. By the way, the total weight of the decorated Christmas tree is 30 tons and 400 kilos. Well, if the size of the tree is any indicator, the presence under it also promise much. The next point of my journey is the Grand Kremlin Palace. Usually, it is the venue for important state ceremonies. Mostly dignitaries are invited here, but in the past, children were also received. Thousands of them came to celebrate the New Year's festivities. The tradition of arranging holidays for children in the Kremlin dates back to more than 50 years. The first reception was in the Grand Kremlin Palace's largest hall, St. George's, in 1954. Back then, the giant Christmas tree was dragged directly up the stairs, through the front door, without much thought, for the ancient interior. Over 60 meters deep, St. George's Hall is the size of a football pitch. A giant fir tree used to be mounted right here. And this massively heavy object used to be dragged across this parquet floor that was originally laid in 1845. When raised, it scraped the chandeliers, each one weighing three tons, by the way, and its tinkling produced an almost surreal, eerie chime. Also, large nails were hammered into this floor to fix this huge Christmas tree. The kids who danced and sang in this hall were asked not to shuffle because it would ruin the floor. Nevertheless, the interior was heavily damaged. Even I was asked to come in with soft indoor shoes, and I tried my best. These walls honor the memory of heroes who received the Order of St. George for their courage. Anastasia Pavlova, a second-generation Hall custodian, is also a fighter, but a fighter to preserve the Hall's reconstruction. So what has changed after the reconstruction? The parquet has definitely changed. They covered it with high-quality varnish to make it brighter. It's very rare 70% of the parquet has survived since 1845, when it was first laid. 30% of the flooring was replaced during restoration in 1968-1969. It took almost a year to restore St. George's Hall alone. Children's parties were moved to a new building in the early 60s, the Kremlin Palace of Congresses, built under Khrushchev. It's obvious that this building is from the Soviet era, and it stands in stark contrast with the Kremlin's architectural character. The palace used to be a key site for communist forums, and now it's the most prestigious musical venue in this country, and also a stage for the world's greatest artists, Charles Aznavour, Sting, Elton John, Tina Turner, you name it, they've all been here.
Right now, rehearsals are underway in the state Kremlin Palace for a New Year's performance for thousands of kids. Inside, we have an appointment with a Kremlin old-timer. Children's writer Alexander Kurlansky scripted the very first Soviet children's New Year party in 1954. I think we've broken the Soviet tradition of staging performances here at the Kremlin. Before that, a boat would fire a shot. The tree would light up, then kids would be shown a play with a revolutionary theme. Then I changed the plot. It was about a boy tired of his current situation, so in the story, he's sent into a different time. On one occasion, when I came to the New Year party, there was no carpet on the floor. I asked where it had gone. It turned out that during the show, some of the children had wet themselves on the carpet out of fear. It had to be washed and hung out to dry afterwards. Nowadays, the New Year performances are more predictable, but still very colorful, nevertheless. By tradition, at the end of the show, the main character of the New Year's celebrations makes his grand entrance. Happy New Year! Children always leave Kremlin with gifts. However, the greatest drama is after the show when parents surround the New Year's tree to pick the children up who risk to disperse like ants in Kremlin's inner sanctum. So how did you like the show? Was it okay or did it give you a shock? All right, so now it's about time to find out where one can eat in here. The Kremlin kitchen is not far, on the fifth floor of the state Kremlin Palace, and we're on our way to meet with a young Kremlin chef, Nicola Ott. Hi. Hello. Sophie. Nicholas, nice to meet you. So you're the new chef everyone's talking about? Yes, I am. What's here? So this is the cold section where we prepare mostly all the appetizers, all the fruit plates, all the vegetables. I can show you more. Sure, let's go. What's over there? This is our hot section. Uh, yeah. That's where we mostly prepare all hot. our soups, our main course. When everybody's here, it's 35 people at one time. So you're the chef and you have 35 employees? Yes. Are they scared of you? Mm, little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is where all the sugar sins take place, yes, huh? Yes, where we bake all our sweet goods. Mmm, so good! And I want to show you where I have the privilege to work. We oh. have a beautiful view of Moscow and landscape. Wow. Usually you told me the kitchens are in a basement. Nikola promised me to teach how to cook one of President Medvedev's favorite dishes. And I wanted to make uh, some kind of pelmini with a European touch. I work with Russian product mm -hmm. and make it kind of French style. It's For the stuffing, crab meat is mixed with vegetables and salad greens. Then it is put onto thinly rolled circles of dough. Shaping them by hand is real art. I don't think I'm doing a very good job closing it. Recent Russian presidents prefer healthy food and smaller portions. The Kremlin chef admits that Dmitry Medvedev is very fond of fish and seafood. For example, lobster salad. Vladimir Putin also prefers fish over meat. In the kitchen, they told us that he loves unsophisticated dishes like bread with herring, never refuses local delicacies on a business trips. So when someone in the countryside treats him with pickled cucumbers, also a traditional Russian delicacy, his security officers break into a cold sweat. As a rule, all meals are very carefully checked before it reaches the presidential mouth. So what do you do when you prepare for the president? You have like secret service guys and like uh, lab people with the lab goggles x-raying your food? It's uh, not that complicated. They come and take uh, samples of all our products mm -hmm. to run just some basic analysis right. and make sure that nothing is uh, bad or poisonous for our VIP people. Alcohol is served only on festive occasions. Putin and Medvedev drink little on holidays. They prefer beer and wine. Boris Yeltsin was a lover of liquors, vodka and cognac. Secretary of State of the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev, 
personally promoted vodka at international receptions. Thanks to him, vodka exports skyrocketed. We've prepared cream sauce with Parmesan cheese to go with ravioli. I guess I can say that I can fit the present now. Are you gonna have some? It's all yours. Mmm. I wanna live in Kremlin. This is so good. <laughs> After lunch, a nap is in order, perhaps in Tsar's bedroom. But I decided first to acquaint myself with those who watch over the peace and quiet in the Kremlin. A whole regiment of young soldiers live here, guarding the Kremlin and the president. Bayonets. The presidential regiment is rehearsing a performance with weapons. Denis and Klim are not only soldiers, but also honor guards. They protect the tomb of the unknown soldier at the Eternal Flame. Can you please show me some special tricks? I can teach you if you want. All right, let's do it. The prep command is... Unfold the bayonet. Let me show you. Then up to the shoulder. Bend to the foot. Hold the carbine with your right hand. I'm not going to cut myself, am I? You won't cut yourself. Unfold it. <laughs> Almost. Now shoulder the weapon. Lift it up. Hold it with your left. I'm holding it. Be careful it should not lean on the left shoulder. This is the position in which we start the honor guard. Young men between 18 and 20 are selected across the country for the presidential regiment. One can say that they are Russia's elite, in perfect health, with a good background and professional appearance. As for the guards, very handsome young men of similar heights are chosen so that they look like twins. Are there emergency situations when people break the existing rules, for example? If people step over the chain, we warn them with this kind of signal tapping the rifle on the ground. The public immediately understands what this noise means and don't go any further. The most frequent violators of the rules are young girls. They always try to flirt with the guards. But this is to no avail. The guards are not allowed to move, never mind smile. So here's your signature move. What is it about? We raise the leg about 70, 80 degrees, move the body forward and put the full foot on the ground. This makes the foot you step with bend a little. And quick march. You're doing it well. You could join our company in a couple of months. To the right. It's time for the guys to prepare for the changing of the guard, but I couldn't miss a chance to take a look at their uniform wardrobe. When it is cold, we wear ceremonial overcoats. The overcoats are very warm with Astrahan collars. Can I touch it? Of course you can. When the temperature is 20 degrees below zero, we wear a warmer uniform called a bikesh. It is made of dense fabric, plus it has very warm fur. It feels hot in it even when it's minus 20. Our journey into the heart of Kremlin is coming to an end, and it's time for me to move behind the Kremlin walls so I can make it for the changing of the guards. The guard change every hour daily from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. These guys brave any weather, be it minus 30 in winter, torrential rains, outrageous hits in the summer. But of course, the hardest part is to stand there motionless no matter what. But hey, that's the price you pay to live rent-free inside the Kremlin. <laughs>